children. So we do start at the age of five um, and go on up from there. So we have started breeding our dogs. We get as many as we can internally. Sometimes we go externally, but we do breed our dogs. This is Pearl. She is a golden doodle. And we start working with these babies when they're two days old. So some of the things that we do, it doesn't seem like training to them. It seems like a lot of fun for us, but we will handle them. We will hold them. We have lots of different people that, will, that we trust, hold them in different ways. We'll hold them upside down. We hold them on their backs. We will do things like that just to get them used to being handled. We will also use a toothbrush to touch them on their heads and their feet and their bellies. It gets them used to the vibration. Their eyes aren't open, their ears aren't open yet, but they get used to that feeling. It really helps them when it comes time for grooming and just handling in general. We also have our puppies. They are born in our home and they live with us for the first eight to nine weeks. This is a picture of scent training. Before their eyes open, we introduce scent. We just want to see what the reaction is. Do they sniff it? Do they lick it? Do they back away from it? It just tells us a lot about their ability to smell right away. Here um, we are also having a baby dragon that's reading to our puppies. It's telling them a bedtime story. So it makes noise, it has lights, and it has movement. And as you can see, our puppies are not bothered by it and they went right to sleep. So these are some of the things we do when they're little. When they're about three to four weeks old, we change and go outside. We start playing on equipment. We play with toys. We get to play with different people. This is a time for them to start learning about their body and about socializing them. So here they're on a swing, so they're learning their balance. We, um, we play fetch with them. And here's a little guy. I mean, you can see the equipment. They can climb up it. They can go underneath it. We do have things on it so it's not slick. We don't want them to fall. We take great care in trying to keep them safe both physically and mentally. After playing, of course, they're dog tired, and this is just pretty cute, but puppies do sleep a lot these first few months. We um, take them for walks. This is one of the first outings that they've had. They're with mom. They're in a safe area where we don't have to worry about diseases, but they're just going on a nice little walk. They're introducing to new smells new um, feelings because there's different grass, there's needles from the trees, things like that. All these things start to build a great service dog. Here we introduce the crate. You notice the doors are open. We aren't locking them in yet. We're just introducing. We want them to think of the crate as a wonderful thing. This is a bridge that we use. It has different, if you notice, it has different things, textures on them. There's a mirror that they look at themselves when they walk over. There's tile, there's wood. We have a little swinging bridge. All these things just help to build their confidence. This is a teeter-totter. Once again, it helps build confidence. And if you notice that the volunteer is holding a treat, this just makes the whole thing positive. So they not only are learning how to have some confidence in walking on different things, but they get rewarded for it as well. And this is just some pictures. It's just cute puppies and enjoying them. Here's another cute baby. These are English cream golden retrievers or golden doodles. So after about seven weeks, we do several tests, one of which is the Voller test. We are not doing the whole Voller test tonight. We're just going to show you a sampling. So the first thing we're going to show you is where we test for submissiveness. And so some things I'm going to ask you to look for is when she puts the dog or the puppy on its back, just look at how it will make eye contact with her. It's not moving. Then it's going to start struggling just a little bit, but it comes right back. It stops struggling and it makes eye contact again with her. This is the type of thing we're looking for. This is a submissive dog that you would have no question about putting this with a child. It has, it's submissive and it still makes contact. Great service dog material. The second test is retrieving. It's really important that the dog want to retrieve, not have to retrieve, but want to. We want them to go get medicine, water, the phone. If it's someone with mobility issues, they might get the wheelchair. 
The next one is going to be a loud noise. So you'll notice the puppy turns away and then she makes a loud noise. The puppy looks to see where it came from, goes up to investigate. Once again, this is exactly what we're looking for in a puppy that we want to move forward in our service dog program. And last but not least is the sight. So the puppy's walked away as it turns around, she's gonna pop open the umbrella, it makes a noise. He stops for a second, then he walks right up to check out what it is. Oh, no big deal. So he goes about his business. Once again, these are definitely the traits we're looking for when we choose service dogs. So once we do the Voller test, it's on to health testing. So the vet's going to look and see if there's anything we need to be concerned about with they're looking at its teeth, they're looking at its overall physical body. Is it healthy? Is it okay? Is there something we need to know about? Once it goes to the vet and we get the all clear, then we're going to go and get their eyes checked. You can see here, we have several different dogs that are in different ages and different levels of training, but all of our service dogs get their eyes checked. They get them checked more than once if necessary. Then we go to the health testing of the heart. We do take our dogs down to a um, teaching uh, university and they do the heart checks for us. Once again, that's an important trait if you have a dog that you want it to be physically and mentally able to do things for several years. And we do hips. Once again, these dogs will be on their feet a lot. They need to brace and help you. So we want them to have a strong body. And so good hips is a very important piece of that. So once they've done their health testing, they're off to school. So the first school, they're gonna go to York. Here they're getting ready to head to the women's prison. We, they go to the women's correctional facility where the women there will start them on their potty training, continue their crate training. Here you see these babies with a vest on. We just introduced the vest. They don't wear these all the times. We want the first initial introduction to be pleasant. So they put the vest on, they get to play, they get to eat in it, and then we take it back off. There will be plenty of time for them to learn that when they have their vest on, that means they're working. Of course, service dogs are working 24 hours a day. But after that, they're gonna go on and start their basic obedience. Here you see a really good look at me. For us, look at me is the foundation command for us. We know that if a dog is looking at you, that's where its attention is. We also know that where the nose goes, the body's going to follow. So if he's looking at you, he's not chasing any squirrels or anybody else. So they work really hard on that. Then they continue their crate training. We know that when you get a service dog and you take it home, that the dog isn't going to be in a crate. You're going to have the dog close to you so it can help you should you have a seizure in the middle of the night. However, sometimes they might need to be in a crate. A couple of examples would be a dog, if you have a child in school and they're going to go to recess, one of the requirements is that the dog needs to be contained. And so they might have to be in a crate in a classroom. So our dogs are very comfortable. They don't mind their crates. They don't know that it's anything bad. They think it's a great place to be. Another time might be if you have to leave and your dog needs, for example, if you go to Disneyland and you want to go on a ride, there's some rides that they will have a crate. You put your dog in the crate so that you can go on the ride and then you come back and get it afterwards. So there's places like that, that a crate is necessary. So we continue their training throughout um, their time with us. The next is going to be distractions. Oh my goodness, look at all the balls. There's a lot of distractions there. The goal is to get the, the puppy to look at you instead of at the balls. And you can see, it looks like they're doing a pretty good job. None of them are running after them. They're staying put, but they, um, they are learning to ignore the distractions out there. We also want them to get used to other types of distractions like scary people. This is a pretty big person. This could also be a statue, something like that. So once again, you see this dog has his eyes and his attention completely on the handler and not on the distraction. Good job. Once they go through all of this, just before they're leaving, we're gonna do the canine good citizen test. It is, this is basic obedience. And it's really important that the dog be able to do this test before they have public access. So here we're gonna show you the first part is loose, 
leash walking. As we know, walking with a dog beside you is important and very difficult to train. So this puppy's four months old. You notice they stopped and met someone on the street, a stranger, and the dog completely ignored her. She's continuing to walk with him. She's making right turns and left turns, and he's following right along. He's really doing an excellent job for just a baby. Here he's looking at something on the ground. I think he dropped a treat, but he's back. He's focused again. Next is going to be where we're walking in a crowd. This is real life. You're going to run into people on the streets and it's important that the dog ignore them. He might add a moment glance in them, but he does not do anything. He just keeps walking with this person. You see his tail wagging, he's having a great time. So here we're gonna show you where we put the dogs in a stay and really they're in a down. While they're there, she's going to walk away with her back to the dog. She's gonna go back to that person or that puppy, tell him it's okay. She's gonna walk away again. And this time she's gonna call him to her. There are several distractions in the room. It's important he comes just to her and he does. And he does an excellent job. He sits down and waits for her to put the leash back on him. Good boy. So once that's done, the puppies, oh, here we're going to do the dog distraction. If you notice, we have two puppies there. The one being tested is four months old and the other one is three months old. So he's not being tested yet. He's not quite ready, as you can tell. He's kind of crossing in front of her, but truly the dog being tested is doing great by ignoring this little puppy. So she's going to put him back in place. You watch her, she's gonna get him back in the healing position right next to her and then they're gonna go about their business. These are all things that take time, but they work with them every single day to get them to this spot. And we're proud of these ladies and we're proud of our puppies. So once they're done with all of this, we're gonna take them out of the prison and they're gonna to go to a puppy raiser. For us, this is a very important part of the dog's training. This could be an individual who's going to college or it might be a family such as here where they have small children. They take this dog and they're gonna put it in their home, treat it like their own for the next year. While they're doing this, they're gonna continue on with their obedience classes. And you can see here where they all get together and they have a class of once a week and learn to continue moving forward on obedience with healing and sit and down and things like that. These are also our families. Once again, we want these dogs to know what it's like to be in a home, to be with a family, to know what it's like day to day, because that's what's going to happen when they graduate as a service dog. And you can see we have some pretty cute volunteers. This is truly socializing. We want these dogs to be used to babies, children of all ages, Babies cry. We don't want the dog to be afraid of them. You can see with this young man, he's touching the dog all over. Once again, that's an important part of this. We want the dog to be okay with you coming over and touching it and putting your hands on it. Because if you have a seizure, you might fall down close to it. Your hand might hit it. So touching is a very important piece of this. So once again, we have some really great volunteers that do some really great things with our dogs. The other things that they do is they will take them to school functions. This is a volleyball game. It's the goal for the dog to lay there, to ignore the ball, not to bark, to leave everybody alone and just lay there like he's doing. We also take them to work. Once they've um, passed their CGC and the employer is okay with it, they will take their dogs to work and have them behave and get to know more people and more things um, such as laying underneath a desk. Here we have um, going out to see grandpa. This is another part where we go into the assisted facilities and nursing homes. We can't have a dog jumping up on our, our grandmas and grandpas because they can be hurt very easily. And you can see he wants to be close, but he's very polite. Good job. Our volunteers as children will also help. So here we have a little girl who borrowed a wheelchair and she's taking the dog out to the mall, ready to take him and get him used to being with someone. Now a child handling a dog in a wheelchair is different than an adult. So this is a critical piece for us in our training and they do an excellent job for us. 
this here is our some of our puppy raisers in our public access. They went to the mall. You can see they're all laying down and behaving. We go into the stores. We have people come up and try and pet them. This is all just a great foundation for when someone finally gets them at the very end. So once again, we so appreciate our volunteers. This is at EADDL at the um, Epilepsy Awareness Day. Um, with our volunteers, those three have gone on and graduated and they're now um, working service dogs. So once we get done with all of that, we put our dogs back in prison for the final um, year of formal training. They will go to the Nebraska State Penitentiary, the Lincoln Correctional Center and the Women's Correctional Facility. And this is where they're going to polish their obedience and start learning the advanced commands that will help their person achieve independence and sense of security. So part of what we are going to do when we're doing our seizure response is we want to identify. It's really important that the dog understand what's happening. And so there's a couple of things that go on. One, if you happen to have some spikes in your brain activity before you actually have a seizure, then we might be able to alert because those spikes release a chemical um, change in you. And that's what the dog can smell and pick up on. So that's an important part if we're going to have a dog alert. So we can't guarantee that with everyone, it just depends on the individual. So this here is Amanda, and what she's going to do is show you how we introduce bump. That is how we notify someone that, yes, you're, you're about to have a seizure or your blood sugars are high or low, and they will bump the individual or their caregiver. Hi, guys. So when you're asking Cisco to bump, what you're going to do is oftentimes, I'm going to just point right here, rocket, bump. Uh-uh. Close like rocket was, I'm going to back them up, rocket, bump. So that's step number one. Step number two that I told you guys about is I'm gonna take the cotton balls in my hand. This obviously doesn't have any seizure scent on it. It's just a blank cotton ball. But what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna close it down with my fist in a little open circle. And I have treats in my other hand. When he sniffs it, yes, good boy. I'm gonna give him a treat. I'm gonna say yes and treat him. Yes, good boy. And you might start moving your hand around. Yes, good boy. You want the dog to move to it. Yes, good boy. And he's gonna get a treat every time he goes to sniff it. Yes, good boy. Uh -uh. Uh -uh. And then what I'm gonna do on a separate training session after he has both of those, I will put my hand down and I will let him sniff it. And I will say bump. bump. Yes, good boy. And you're gonna start adding it together. You can see he's not used to this process either. So he's gonna have to add it together. Thanks, Amanda. So one of the things that she did mention that's a critical piece of what we do with our training is we do positive reinforcement. It's a lot better to get the dog to do something because he wants to, not because he has to. So here you see, once again, it's another way of alerting the individual that, hey, we have a problem. They lay their head on their lap. So that would be the initial part. After we've identified it's important that they notify. So now you're having a seizure and I need to let mom and dad know or whoever the caregiver is. So we teach the dog to ring the bell. We want the dog to ring the bell twice. The reason we ask them to ring the bell two times is because the first time, maybe you stepped outside to get the newspaper or maybe the phone was ringing or maybe the dryer was going off. So we ask the dog do it to do it two times and you will see that they'll hit it once. And if it doesn't ring, they know that. 
and they'll go back and ring it again and then still ring it two times. So that's an important piece of notifying. When you hear the bell, you need to come running. We do um, suggest putting the bell wherever the person is most of the time. For example, maybe you put a bell in the bedroom, in the bathroom, the playroom, and out in the backyard. So that way the dog does not have to go very far when he needs to ring it. So after he's rang the bell, he said, hey people, please come and help. We have problems here. The next is going to be where we do nudge. Depending on what type of seizure you have or what position you are in, we understand everybody's different. So we train it differently. But this is a nudge. This is for individuals that fall flat, face down and can't breathe. It could be because you're laying in the snow, you're on your bed in a pillow. It could be a number of things, but we wanna make sure that if you are face down and can't breathe, as a dog come in, he'll push your head to the side and open up your airwaves. This in itself can be such a life-saving task. After that, um, another one of the things that we are going to do is we will do a cover. Cover is where the dog will lay on somebody who is a runner. So there are certain types of seizures where once they get it, they just take off running and will head out into the woods or out on a busy street. So we ask them to cover. Um, once they are covering, you can't get up. If they're on the bottom part of your legs, you cannot get up. I don't care how big you are, you cannot lift your body up if the dog is on your lower part of your legs. Another one is pressure. There are some individuals that truly just need deep pressure that helps to keep their seizures from escalating. It's a calming for them. It's up to the individual where they want the dog to put the pressure. As you can see here, this is a real seizure and that's where she wants her dog. So we teach them to put the deep pressure wherever it is you need it. After we do um, pressure, we have a few different types of seizures. One is where you're walking. So when you're walking down the street and you're hooked up to your dog, you have a leash on, those look very different than if you're in your home, they're not gonna ring a bell. So here where we, I'm gonna give it just a moment. So what you're gonna see here is you're walking down the street and then you fall down. Once you go down, the dog should come over. You see, he starts to go one side. He comes back to the side with the leash. He's pushing me on my side. He's going to lay there until I tell him I'm all done and he can get back up. The reason this is so critical is because if he goes on the other side, the leash is going to go across the person's neck and it could choke you. The dog can also get tangled up on it and choke himself. So it's very critical that the dog go down the same side the leash is on. Another type of seizure, this is where a person is walking once again, but they babble or they say things that are incoherent and they start talking. So the dog understands this. Once he hears that type of talk, he's going to go down. As you can see, this is a big guy and he is not pulling this dog anywhere. The other thing you notice is that the dog kept his eyes on him the whole time. So last but not least is the seizure where you're down on the ground in your home. So here you're going to see the dog ring the bell twice. Once he goes down, you'll see he'll go over and he'll ring it. This is why it's important to have several bells throughout your home. He rings it a second time, then he's gonna go back. He's going to push him on his side where this is important is for individuals that either vomit or have a lot of saliva, and we want that to get out of their mouth. So once you're on your side, everything should drain out and keep you safe until help comes. The dog should stay there once again until you release him. And once you've done that, um, you're ready for the next phase. But as you see with these, the seizures are not pretty, they're ugly. And it's an important part that these dogs play, getting the person on their side. It lets the individual, the parent and the caregiver get to work on what they need to do with their child. As you can see here, she is busy talking to him, making sure he's okay Why the dog keeps him on his side. It's one less thing that mom has to worry about, but yet it's a critical piece. So after the seizure comes the commanding part. So sometimes while you're seizing, a parent might need the dog to go get medicine. 
This is something you no longer have to do. The dog will go get it for you. So they'll get the medicine, they'll get water. If you need them to bring the phone so you can dial 911. This is a point in time where the dog knows very many tasks by their name and will go and get you what you need. Once it's done that and you start to come to, you might need help getting up, especially if you're on the floor. If you notice how this dog is laying, he's got his back legs underneath his hip. This is so that it keeps him healthy. And yet he can help you while you're down to get up on your knees. At that point in time, the dog can stand up like here and he will help you the rest of the way up. And then once you're up, he will take you to the couch, the chair, the bed, wherever you need to go to rest until you're ready to move on with your day. So other than the seizures, there's many tasks that our dogs learn. There's about 90 to 100 different tasks. This is where they learn to take the shoes off. This is fun if you can take your own shoes off, but for someone with a balanced mobility issue, this is a great task that helps them because they couldn't do it themselves. Other than shoes, they will do the stairs. Why the stairs are important? Just think about it for a moment. If you're walking up and down the stairs and you have a seizure, you need to have your dog right beside you. He needs to be able to help you. He's not going to necessarily stop you from falling, but he will help you and keep your fall from being too bad. And you can see here, this is the first time this little girl ever took a step on her own. So it's a critical piece that those dogs, and this is another one, it's just critical the dog walks beside them and not ahead of them. So another thing that they do is they can do a handicap button. They can open doors and drawers. Once again, if the medicine's in a drawer, they need to be able to tug it open. Um, open the refrigerator if they need to get you water. So tugging is an important piece of what they do. You might need them to bring your wheelchair to you. And here's the handicap button. If that's something you need and you can't reach it yourself, you know, we're not, we don't have very many of those anymore. Most of the doors open up on their own, but these dogs will do it if it's needed. So after all of this training happens, the real excitement begins. And this is where the dog and the people come together. This is where we've matched the dog with the person based on their personality, activity level, physical needs, and the dog's skill set and activity level. Why this is so critical that, I'm sorry, this is why it is so critical that families are honest when they're telling us their story. We need to know everything there is about you. We choose your dog based on the information we receive from you. Once you are selected as a recipient, we will either meet you in person if you're local or we will Zoom with you several times throughout the year, the formal training period. We wanna make sure when we are custom training this dog for you, it's not for anyone else, but for you, that those tasks and those seizure response skills are what you need. And as you will see, we do a really great job of matching people and their dogs. One of the things when they get their dogs, the puppy raiser gets to hand them over for the first time. They don't know what dog they're getting. They just know they're getting a dog. And so here they're coming, they get to, the puppy raiser gets to meet the recipient and their family. It's a very touching thing. It's very rewarding for all. And it also gives the recipient an opportunity to talk to the puppy raiser to find out some things about their dog and to thank them firsthand. So once they get their dog, that's when the real education starts. So this is where the first few days we go through a lot of book learning. We want to teach you about the commands. We want to tell you how we train the dog so that you can continue that training once you go home. So while this is a little boring, it's an important part of it. So after we've done our schooling, we're going to hit the streets. And this is where the big van comes in. So this van, we all get together, we get in it, and we have so much fun on the van going places. We sing, we play games, we get to really get that bonding process with the other campers in full gear. So here we are, we're headed on our first trip. And of course, the first trip is going to be walking. It's um, really important that these dogs are able to heal and see squirrels, rabbits, other dogs, and not pay any attention to them. So the first few days, we're going to do a lot of walking outside. Um, 
and making sure that they can handle the distractions. So once we have gone to our walkways, we're gonna to go to the park. And here you can see where we have to learn how to handle the service dog through all of the equipment. And that can be a challenge, especially for someone so small. But we have individual trainers Sometimes, usually we have enough trainers that we can put one trainer with each recipient. At least that's what we strive for. So as you can see, one-on-one -on -one is really important. And here we have headed to the putt-putt golf. It's a dinosaur theme putt-putt. Um, we're all getting ready to go inside. It's really important that the dog stay with the person. They need to leave the grass alone. They need to stay out of the way of the ball and not chase anyone else's balls either. So it's a lot of fun going through training, but the dogs and the people are learning a lot along the way. Bowling is another thing that we can do with our service dogs. We are truly trying to introduce those types of things that you might do on your typical day or your weekend. So we do a variety of activities and bowling is one of them. We also have fun time. As you can see here, everybody had a chance to play with some puppies. They were about six weeks old. They were just a ball of fern. It was a uh, fur. It was a great way to relieve stress and just be able to get down and have some fun. We do some play time and this is where they get to go through the tunnels. And this time we have <laughs> the little girl going through the tunnel instead of the dog. It's very important that in your bonding, you play with your dog. So we really encourage that throughout camp. Another thing that people don't think about is how am I going to get my dog on an airplane, either to fly home or perhaps I'm going somewhere else. So here's where we do our training. We teach the dogs to get really small and then we put them under the seat in our makeshift airplane. So here we all are on our plane. We're getting ready to fly out someplace really lovely like Hawaii. And so they're all waving us goodbye. You can't see the dogs because they're underneath the seats where they should be. And we are out here, we are at the mall. Um, once again, these are activities that you might do on your day to day. You're gonna go out at some point in time in public and it's important your dog and you be able to do so comfortably. But once again, we wanna make sure we're having fun. So we take time out. Here we have some uh, toys that the big guys get to ride on. So they're gonna ride these around and their dog is gonna stay right beside them. You don't see any fear here, you just see fun. After we've gone through our 10 to 12 days of camp, um, and I don't know if I really mentioned that, but for 10 to 12 days, you are in Lincoln, Nebraska. Um, we put you up in a hotel, but after you've done all of these tasks towards the end, we do have a test. You have to pass with your dog to show that you can handle your dog on your own, not with any parents, even if you're five years old, you need to do this on your own. So we go to the state capitol. One of the reasons we go to the state capitol is because there, our Nebraska is a great supporter of service dogs and service dogs in training. So we like to recognize them. So they're going to walk around the block. They're going to cross streets by themselves. They're going to manage going through elevators and doors. This is their big test for them to show they truly have become one team together. After the test comes the celebration and it truly takes a village to train these dogs. And as you can see here, we have volunteers, we have the recipients, their dogs and family members. And we appreciate and thank all of our volunteers for what they do to make a service dog successful. So once all of that is done, we're gonna to head to the graduation ceremony. Our um, graduation happens at the prison. We go there so that the inmate handlers who have handled the dog for a whole year and taught them everything, have an opportunity to meet the individual who's going to get the dog. And we call it turning over the leash. This is where the inmate handler actually hands the dog over knowing he's never going to pet or touch this dog again. And he knows that the person getting the dog is getting someone, something that he's trained and worked hard for. They also get a certificate 
the team does, saying that they've accomplished their goals, they reached everything they needed to, and they get an ID with their picture and their pet's picture or their service dog's picture on it. And then when it's all said and done, we do a group picture with the handlers, the individuals, and their dogs. So after, after we're done with that, things don't end. With domestic pups, it's ongoing. You have um, relationships that are built during camp and they continue on. We are here for the duration. And I'm, we have made friendships and they continue to see each other when they go home. They, it doesn't stop just because camp is over. They continue to build on those relationships and we aren't going anywhere either. We have a Facebook page that you will join where you will meet all of the other families that successfully completed their camp years before. They will help you when you go through certain issues that maybe they had when they got their dog. But Domesta Pups is there as well. We're going to answer your questions. We're going to continue to meet with you via Zoom. We will, you can text us, you can email us, however works for you, you can reach out to us and we're going to be there and we're going to help you because there are going to be times you're going to have stresses. There are going to be times when you think, oh my goodness, I broke my dog and we're going to be there to help you. We're not going anywhere. And as you can see here, these individuals have gone on and they are now living their lives with their best friend right beside them. This gentleman is checking out people at the grocery store and those people don't even know he has a dog. He's laying down quietly where he should be. They go on and they do whatever it is you need to do, the dog is going to do with you. Whether it's getting married, going for a bike ride, the independence that the individual gets with these service dogs are priceless. There's no way you can put any value on being able to allow that, allow your child to ride a bike, whether they're showing sheep or swimming. These dogs are here and they're here with their person 24 hours a day, seven days a week, so that when you can't be with them, they can. They go to school, they even get their own IDs. They also show up in yearbooks from time to time, but being able to send your child to school with its service dog is such a relief for so many parents because they know that their child will be safe. They even make it all the way to graduation. And as you can see, he graduated as well because he has his cap on. They go to pumpkin patches. They even grow old with us. As you can see, this one's a little gray around the muzzle. They've been a team for many years now. And they go to hospitals with us and they do tests with us and they go to the doctors with us. These are times that can be really stressful and emotional for our children because they've spent so much time in doctors and hospitals. But the dog is always there you can see, they reach out for them without even thinking about it. Once again, this is something that you can't put a price on and we can't do it for them, but the dog can. In this picture, you see where they're always watching out. They're always looking, making sure you're safe. They're another set of eyes. When we can't see them, they can. And they help us to know what's going on and that our child is safe. And if not, they hopefully will let us know that as well and get our attention to come and help. The next part is going to be testimonials where um, some of the parents who had children that received service dogs from us are going to talk a little bit about what it has meant to them, both going through camp and receiving a service dog. Um, it's going to last about nine minutes. So once that is done, then we will come back here and close. My name is R.L. Byrne, and I am from Aurora, Colorado. My service dog's name is Parker. His favorite toy is the ball. Our son, R.L., uh, was born with epilepsy. Uh, he was diagnosed, actually, at 18 months. 
So from 18 months until today, today he's 34. Our family has gone through all of the changes, all of the stress, all of the pain, all of the advocacy, all of the things that families with family members who have uh, disabilities go through. I've heard about domestic pots from my mom. She told me about it, so I came here to get my service done. Our younger son, Miles, unfortunately, in um, 2016, suffered a seizure. Uh, he has had epilepsy and passed away as a result of that. Uh, after um, the death of our son, we were under tremendous stress because our son actually was in the home when he had a seizure and passed away. We did not know he was in crisis. Our older son, RL, having a domestic pups dog will alert us. It will give us peace of mind. It will give us just something, something very valuable in knowing that when RL has a seizure, that we will be, if we're in the home with him, we'll be notified. If we're not in the home with him, the dog knows what to do to come to RL's aid. There's no greater peace, no greater comfort that we could ask for at this time than to have a domestic pup's dog to assist us in aiding and alerting and in assisting not only us, but assisting more so RL. He's going to change my life like 100%. He's going to help me with my seizures. He will respond immediately if I ever have one. He will lay down while I'm on the register with um, checking out other people's groceries. To the trainer who trained Parker, from everyone who loves RL, our family says thank you. What you're doing is giving comfort. What you're giving, doing is giving peace of mind. What you're doing is giving a full night's rest. I get up during the night, three, four time, times a night, just to look in on my son. And as a result of what you're doing, I may be able to get a night's sleep. So thank you. What you're doing, is allowing RL to be independent, to go uh, out and not worry about what happens, what might happen if he has a seizure. And I just want to, on behalf of our family, encourage you to continue to do what you're doing. Thank you for giving me an awesome dog like Parker. <laughs> Shaylin, and um, I am getting a service talk. I am here because I have epilepsy. My, my dog's name's Cricket. She had her VNS surgery in October, and then her seizures started to change a little bit, and it made me really nervous that what happens if I don't hear anything. Well, having a service dog for Shaylin will change our life because I can actually, I can sleep. And I won't be worried. If she has a seizure, I'll know that she has someone there. It will save my life for not, like, her. Save me from not having seizures anymore. And me on my side. And so I won't stop breathing and not suffocate. He rings a bell. So my mom knows. Just seeing when we practiced the first couple times, her just spring in action, I was completely blown away. And as we continue to practice and she gets better and better, I'm just in awe of how much work you guys have put into her, what you were able to do.
I didn't really know what to expect. I knew it was going to be hard work, but I didn't realize how much work it was going to be, even just for me. And I would tell Shay at the end of every day, like, gosh, if I'm exhausted, I can only imagine how exhausted you are. But seeing the change in her confidence from day one to now, I've never seen it. I would say to other parents who are considering a service dog to, um, you know, understand it is hard work. And I instill that into Shaylin all the time, every day. <laughs> this is hard work. It doesn't stop just because we go home. But it'll be so worth it. Be excited and just be ready. Don't be nervous. Mom, thank you. Um, thank you guys for, for this opportunity. It's really fun to get a service dog. I, I like, I, I really love her. on the wish trip um, with the Chelsea Hutchinson Foundation and we come across the booth at Epilepsy Awareness Day and my daughter instantly gravitated to your dogs not anybody else's dogs that were there and she wouldn't leave <laughs> and it was then when I realized that I really wanted to make this happen for her. A lot of her worries are that she'll be out somewhere at school or wherever and um, have a seizure and nobody will know or um, believe her. <laughs> That's happened before. I say random things and he lays down and he stops me. I think it's, you know, it's not only going to help her with seizures, I think it's going to help her with stress levels and comfort and just that that feeling of being secure um, and having someone there for her, a friend. Um, I'd like to tell other parents that are considering this, that this is possible. It will change your child's life. You need to know what you're walking into, what commitment it is, and the details of um, it's just not a, a everyday pet. It's a working animal. It's very crucial that you follow the instructions um, and you treat it as a working animal and not as a pet. That's what, and that's what I learned. Um, and I think it's very crucial for any family to carry a dog home knowing it's a working animal and it's not a toy. Thank you. Thank you for sacrificing your free time and your energy and putting your love into this dog that will change her life. And I can't express how grateful I am for that. It really is on change Brianna's life and make her a mature adult at some point in time where she's independent and she's not relying on us to do everything for her. So as we're, as we're going through this, these are our camp photos of the groups. Um, just to reiterate, it's about a 10 to 12 day camp. This is a long-term commitment we make with you, your dog and your family. Our hope is that these dogs will be with you for many years and that your bonding will continue and that you will be able to rest a little better knowing your child's best friend is with them all the time. Before, during, and after a seizure, your, their dog is there. The best friend and independence this dog will bring to you or your child is priceless. The social barriers that come falling down when you walk into a room with a service dog is priceless. What we'd like to do is thank you all for joining us today. Remember to go to the Domestic Pups link to get your swag bag and additional information that you might have either about starting the process if you want to move forward or just information. 
Um, is there, do we have any questions out there, Michelle? So I think with that, um, that's about to the close of ours. We have a few minutes. And, and so I'd like to just go back. Some of the things that you saw, those pictures, that is where we were actually going out and about. Camp is long days and long nights. When they talk about it's exhausting and that the work really um, is hard, it is. Because we will go out and about. We do take naps and rest because we understand everybody needs to do that. But then we're going to come back to the room and we're going to practice seizure work right away within the second or third day with you, your dog, and your person. And we're going to practice those seizures so that we can start getting that down before you go home. So you know how to continue working on that. If you have real seizures, you're going to call us because someone is there with you 24 hours a day. We're going to come and we're going to help show you how to work through your dog, utilizing your dog to help you and the person who's having the seizure. So there's a lot of work in it, but it is so worth it at the end of the day. We have no doubt that when you leave that you will feel like you're our team with your dog and that you're able to go out and make a difference in your life every day and your parents. The, um, one of the things that um, was asked earlier is about training someone else's dog or your own personal dog. We don't do that. Um, the reason we don't do that when we went out and we're looking for dogs at shelters before we started our own breeding program, we would test a hundred dogs and out of that hundred dogs, we would find 10 with the right temperament. Then we would do the physical test and that would drop it down to seven. By the time the dogs graduated, we would be down to three. It is not easy for a dog to be a service dog. That's why we spend so much time and effort in finding the dogs that have the right health and the right temperament. You go out in public, that can be a pretty scary thing for a dog if it doesn't have the right temperament. Things drop from the shelves. There's um, all kinds of noises and many dogs just can't take that pressure. So we do feel the reason ours works and that we get the dog and we match it with you is because we know our dog is going to make it in public access. It's going to make it doing the type of seizure work he needs to do for you. He mentally will be ready for that. So that's one of the reasons that we place the dog versus having you train your own or having us train your dog. Um, I think that kind of covers it all. Um, if you have any questions. One of the questions we had before was how can they get a service dog? I know you just touched on it at the beginning, but... So how do you get a service dog? Number one is if you get a swag bag, that's going to have the information out there. What you're going to do is you're going to fill out an application. Um, it, there are some requirements to get a service dog. You need to have a physical need. So someone who is healthy cannot have a service dog. We're not going to place it with them. There's too many people who do have a need. So we do need something from your doctor that they feel like a service dog would benefit you. Um, we are going to have you fill out a questionnaire so we find out more information about you. Once you do that, we are going to meet with you. And as I said earlier, either in person or we might Skype or have a Zoom meeting. Um, we're going to answer your questions. You'll answer ours. Based on that conversation, then if you decide that you want to move forward, then we are going to start the paperwork and we will meet with you several times after that. We want to make sure that the dog we are training is specifically for you and your needs. And if your needs change, we want to make sure we know that sooner rather than later so that we can train your dog to either identify a new type of seizure or maybe, um, maybe it's something completely different. Maybe all of a sudden you have one side that's weaker than the other. So we need the dog to walk on the right side instead of the left. So we will continue working with you as we're training your dog. Um, we, we also ask for videos and I don't know if I even mentioned that. So one of the things we ask families to do if they decide to go with us 
is we want to have a video of your seizure. And it's hard, we get it, we know. It's hard to take a video of the person having a seizure because you wanna help them. But it's really a critical piece for us to do the seizure response. We have to know what it looks like. So we do ask that you take videos when your person, your child has a seizure and you send it to us. If um, they have spikes, we ask that you um, swab their mouth and you get us some scent, you freeze it and you ship it to us. Those are the types of things that we trust you. If you don't get us those things, we can't do our part. So it's really important that we work together on these things and um, keep informed, like I said, of anything that's going on in your life that's changed. Um, the other thing that makes Domestopops a little different, while there are many good service dog agencies out there, we're not large. We graduate um, on average anywhere five, six dogs a year. Um, we sometimes might start out with more than that, but we end up with five or six dogs a year. The reason we like to keep them a little smaller is as I said, we would like to have somebody with each individual, whether it's a volunteer or a trainer that um, is there full time. We like to have somebody with each family as we go out on outings. That way we make sure that everything is going okay, the commands are being used appropriately. If there's something that happens and you need help, we can get you the help. We also like to give you a lot of one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I explained that we like to come to the room and work on seizures privately. It's hard to do that if you have very many. So um, we have everybody at the hotel together. Um, that way we can go from one room to the next as we're doing the seizure work. But all of that takes time and there's only so many hours per day. So we do um, pride on ourselves maybe being a little smaller, but in being small, we feel we do a very good job and a very personal job with each and every recipient that comes through our doors. Are there any other questions? Anything else we wanna close up with? If not, once again, I wanna thank you for joining us tonight. I appreciate you spending your time, we all do. Um, fill out the information or go to the link, get your swag bag, and we look forward to talking to you in the future. And have a good day.